Well, hello there. Fancy meeting you. Hello, good afternoon, David Petz. Uh, thank you so much for appearing on Meet the Archaeologist. Hello. Um, first of all, could you just introduce yourself and uh, your role in the department and also how you got into archaeology? Right, so my name's David Petz. I'm a lecturer in archaeology at the department here in Durham. I um, teach, do a lot of teaching, mm -hmm. I do a lot of researching, I work particularly on early medieval things mainly. Okay. And I particularly run our big departmental field school at the Roman Fort at Binchester. Mm -hmm. So they're my kind of main jobs. How did I get into archaeology? Um, I was a horribly precocious child who got very interested in Roman ruins and castles very young. Mm -hmm. We had relatives in Kent, so we used to go see them and go around lots of the castles and particularly remember the Roman fort at Richborough, mm -hmm. mainly because it had lots of earth banks you could roll down, but that kind of got me into archaeology very, very young. I stayed interested in it and I went to university mm -hmm. and after a range of jobs I've ended up here in Durham as a lecturer. I see, okay. So, well, I don't know, this is, this is kind of a strange one. You seem to be a, a bit of a jack of all trades, in so much as uh, I remember you from teaching 20th century archaeology, um, and recently we filmed together on a site called Binchester, where you just found, or rather one of your students had just found, uh, a very famous Roman head. Um, what do you have a favourite period, or, you just, uh, or do, you, do you enjoy sort of spreading it around? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm an academic tart. I, I like, I like, I'm interested in most things. I mean, most of my work is on early medieval things. So I suppose that's where my, my academic kind of heartland is. Mm -hmm. But I'm generally interested in the medieval world. Um, I stray into the Romans, particularly through digging at Binchester, and I'm increasingly influ interested in post-medieval things, mm -hmm. um, so particularly 20th century archaeology, I've got various things under my belt at the moment. I, I don't get so excited by prehistory, I must admit. <laughs> Once you get to the Mesolithic, I, I, I start getting a bit detached from it all. Okay, okay. Um, well, okay, well, it's nice to hear that you, that you do actually have limits, so that's good. That's good. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the, the Binchester find actually from earlier this year, uh, well the Binchester site but especially that find, um, ha, ha, did it, has it exposed you to other elements of being a, a working archaeologist in terms of for example talking to the media and this kind of thing? Yes, I mean Binchester we attracted a lot of press particularly this summer we discovered a Roman head so we had a, a lot of press interest mm. and I've dealt with media before, we've had people come to Binchester before but the first time we had the press queuing up to do interviews. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of kind of uh, interest from the local region. We always had local interest, but national and international, which was a bit of a, a bit of a surprise. We weren't expecting it to suddenly strike such a chord mm. with the press. Mm. Okay. Um, so clearly, talking to little old me won't, won't be remotely uh, <laughs> no. Uh, any, no challenge at all. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to a little old campus <laughs> the last year. Excellent. Yes. Um, well, actually, if it, what, what would you say is a little-known um, element of, of early medieval archaeology in the North Eastern? Right, what I'm interested in is particularly what's going on in northern Northumberland and southern Scotland. One of the troubles we have is the Anglo-Scottish border today really influences, even now, how we look at that region. Mm -hmm. And people tend to look at what's happening in North, North Northumberland and not stray over into southern Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting increasingly interested in what's going on up there, and particularly because I'm interested in the British rather than the Anglo-Saxons at the moment, particularly interested in the people who were here when the Anglo-Saxons arrived. Mm -hmm. And in southern Scotland there's all sorts of interesting things going on, particularly um, some interest, a group of interesting inscribed gravestones in Latin, right. which aren't terribly well known and are located in incredibly remote little valleys in the Scottish borders, but I'm interested in looking at those at the moment. I see, I see. So, so do, do, do you think that, um, uh, that actually that, that period has a bearing on the geopolitical situation at the moment where we're about to have a vote in Scotland on independence? Do you think that this actually has a bear, bearing on it? Or do you think that actually the perception of that isn't helpful? It's, it's difficult. I mean, certainly in Scotland, generally speaking, there's much more interest when it comes to the early, early medieval period in the mm. Picts. They are seen as the, the, kind of the Scottish people, mm. the ancestors. 
the, the Anglo-Saxons you know, got well into what is now Scotland, so it's mm -hmm. Anglo-Saxon things over in much, much of kind of Lothian, but there's less interest. But to be fair, there are people doing work on it, mm. and perhaps it gets less wider publicity. Mm. And, and there's all sorts of practical problems. The great, the great corpus of Anglo-Saxon sculpture doesn't go into Scotland. No. Um, no. And uh, some of the big Scottish volumes don't really deal with the Anglo-Saxon thing. So mm. it, it kind of falls between a crack of it. Mm. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff, but it's perhaps just not as well appreciated as it should be. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but, that, but that's very interesting and, and, uh, and politically delicate answer. Yeah. I like it. Um, savvy. <laughs> well, I suppose um, moving on then from, from your, your specific research interests um, more broadly, what, what have you found satisfying about being an archaeologist, in particular now, I suppose, being, uh, being a teacher of archaeology? Oh, I just really enjoy my job, basically. I mean, I'm lucky because archaeology is my hobby. And so I'm lucky that I, I get to do my hobby for a living. Mm. Um, I, what I like about the moment with being at the university is like I, I get a lot of diversity. So I get time out in the field, I get to go out and do field work, I get to go and dig great sites. Um, but luckily I do that in the summer, so when the weather starts coming in, I get to do other things. So obviously I'm, a lot of the time I'm doing research, so mm. I'm, I'm writing and I've got various things on the go at the moment. And also I really enjoy working with the students. Teach, I'm, I'm currently teaching a course on Central Britain, Anglo-Saxons, British, picked Scots, all mm -hmm. this kind of thing, and it's really fun actually teaching that to students, and actually mm. kind of gives me a chance to go back and remind myself about this material, and you get some really interesting feedback and really good ideas, even you know, even though they, you can, I, I kind of think I, I know this material better than them, but you know, they actually have some really interesting perspectives, so yeah. it's, it's, it's it's entertaining. Okay. Um, and I, I say it, isn't, it is reassuring to hear that the that, that, that guys at the front uh, also need to be reminded of things every now and then. Oh yes, well, there is that side Because <laughs> uh, I know I certainly do. <laughs> um, okay, so, so what, in terms of the people that, that you're currently teaching, um, is there anything that you see in the near future which will be a challenge for, for this current crop of, of students and possibly people who just want to become professionals? I mean, archaeology is, at the moment, we've got a recession going on, and a lot of archaeology, commercial archaeology, is essentially a um, subcontractor of the construction industry. Mm. And obviously, with not so much development going on at the moment, it knocks onto archaeology. So, in terms of job opportunities, they're perhaps more limited than they were a while ago. Mm -hmm. But things are getting better, and actually, there are jobs in archaeology and in my experience students if they're really keen and they persevere mm -hmm. you know, they can get to work in the sector but it's mm -hmm. not easy. The other big problem is um, people wanting to go on to do postgraduate work mm -hmm. is funding is getting increasingly competitive. Mm -hmm. In the past if you were really if you're good you could get funding. Nowadays often even if you're good mm -hmm. it's, you still may not be able to get that funding mm -hmm. which is a shame so you see a lot of really talented people not being able to carry on at postgraduate level, mm. Mm. which is which is a pity, mm. uh, and I'm not sure things will improve on that front no. in the near future. Okay. Um, I have to say, I mean, my experience was certainly one where I ended up having to create my own vacancy, um, <laughs> rather than just keep on applying um, for positions that, as you say, just in many cases just simply weren't yeah. there. Um, speaking of, of development, uh, just in case uh, people can hear this on the mic, there is a lot of building going on outside, so that's nothing to do with those. Um, but um, you, you, we just touched on the I suppose, challenges for uh, future students or students who want to go into archaeology. Um, but you were mentioning how uh, recently you've been talking about uh, Saxon England and the Central England, this kind of thing. Recently, there's been a move in uh, the national curriculum under Michael Gove to, to introduce the heptarchy uh, to primary school. Um, do you think this is, this is a good move? I, I'm really pleased that they are trying to put archaeology mm. and kind of pre normal history into the curriculum. Mm. I do worry that trying to get some of these things into the primary level, they're trying to explore some quite complicated ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's great that they're getting archaeology and early history into early years learning. I suspect they may need to think about precisely what it is they're teaching. Mm. And one of the great things about archaeology is actually because it's to do with not it's to do with daily life, what do people eat, what kind of houses they live in. Mm. It's something which is quite accessible to, to very young kids and I think that's something they actually quite engage with. Mm -hmm. 
whether the heptarchy of the Synod would be something that six-year-olds can comprehend, I, I doubt. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. That's, a, that's certainly an interesting perspective. And um, um, we've said we've, on this in this series actually we've had a few uh, a few perspectives along the lines of, for example, uh, the importance of teaching a broader mm. idea of history to to, 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 the, to the public, and therefore in public school, uh, sorry, in, uh, the country's education system in the curriculum. Um, but yeah, I suppose yeah, as you say, there needs to be a realism about what people can handle. I guess. Yeah, I mean. I, it's brilliant. I, I'm really, really mm. keen that we're doing early stuff, mm. but it's just a case of how we do it um, when you're dealing with, with, with young children, mm. where their, their basic knowledge of geography of Britain mm -hmm. may mm -hmm. not be great. No, no. And, no. But I think what I like about you know, doing archaeology is it gives them that real, it gives them something to hang on to, it gives them that material stuff they can look at pots and jars and brooches mm. and it, it, it gives you it gives them a very easy way to connect and when mm. it's done well it's absolutely fantastic mm. and speaking mm. of someone who's got two young children who are in, I mean, they don't have any choice in yeah. my house they, yeah. they have archaeology rubbed in their faces mm. but, you know, it, but, but, but they really but they do really engage this yeah. um it's really not the fact that we're teaching a particular period it's just how it's done mm. so yeah i i think again trying to teach things like Dissolution of monasteries or mm. prostitute work ethic is there's also you can do with a six year old or a seven year old. No. They mm. can understand what a water biking town looked like or yeah, yeah. what an Anglo Saxon village looked like. Yeah, okay. Um, as far as the geography of Britain goes, I remember uh, um, when I was about six or seven, I won a prize for drawing a map of Britain, um, and the only accurate part was the bit where I lived. Everything else <laughs> kind of like a teapot, you know. So, yeah, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Um, well, it, it, looking at. Uh, um, I suppose in a more aspirational sense, uh, what advice would you give to people who want to get into archaeology, whether they're students or, or just interested amateurs at this stage? Um, you, you need to have a sense of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of jobs in archaeology in the sense that there's lots of different uh, paths you can follow. There's working as a commercial field archaeologist, a fine specialist in a museum, academia, but you need to have some sense of what it is you want to do because you're the precise things you need to work on will vary. Mm. You can't just take a kind of random approach. Mm -hmm. um, I'd encourage people to make links and then get to know people because mm -hmm. personal connections are still really important. Just hearing on the grapevine that things are going on. I think being quite targeted about whether when you're doing things like postgraduate, what you're interested in. Think about whether you want to go down an academic route, whether you want to do acquire some more practical vocational skills. Have a think about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And also just try and go above and beyond doing, you know, doing your basic essays, doing your assignments, get involved in projects, be proactive, mm -hmm. be positive. And there's so many projects which are looking for volunteers out there. Mm -hmm. You need to show that you, know, you, you can get out there and do these things. And that helps you build up experience, it helps you make those links. I think mm -hmm. that's really important. Mm -hmm. Don't just focus on the essays, go out and get involved more generally. Interesting, thank you. Um, okay, well, well uh, I suppose finally, um, what are your current plans? What, what's on the horizon for you in terms of your work? Right, okay, um, we're still digging at Binchester. We're going to do mm -hmm. another two years at Binchester, we hope. Um, and then I think we are going to draw it to a close. Okay. We'll be out there for seven years. Um, more generally, I'm trying to get some field work up and running on Holy Island in Lindisfarne, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Someone interested in early medieval Christianity. Mm -hmm. We've done a geophysical survey of that already. And we're hoping to get quite involved with a big heritage lottery funded project on the island so that's so that's something over the next year or two we're going to get on with mm -hmm. i'm also developing some of my interest in the post-medieval things so um i'm very interested in the kind of coastal landscapes in north northumberland of lighthouses and lifeboats and fishing harbors and which is something people haven't really looked at mm -hmm. i've just put a grant in to try and get some money to look at the archaeology of the 20th century landscape, right. particularly the impact of the Great Depression in the 1930s, mm. where we see all sorts of things. We see deindustrialisation. Uh, myself and a, and a colleague are looking at the um, a labour camp for unemployed ironstone miners right. in Cleveland, right. which had 96% unemployment in, in the oh, wow, sorry. You can left place like Jarrett is standing. Yeah, yeah. So we can, we can, hopefully we, we want to try and look at how the landscape change and, and the growth, particularly these labour camps and mm. work camps, which mm. people tend to think of happening in the States, but not realise that it actually happened over here. Well, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, famously, the, there was the one in Central Park in New York and this kind of thing. You think you think about it being a US issue. Yeah. 
very interesting. Yeah, even even in um, this area, there's this big one up in up in uh, Cleveland. Uh -huh. There was uh, the forestry camps in uh, getting workers doing forestry jobs uh -huh. up in Hampstead Forest and Weirdale. So there's a lot around, but they've kind of been missed out. Right. But there's still there's still physical remains there. You can still see the traces of these things. Mm. And nowadays, the um, certainly the Hampstead Forest one, mm. the visitor centre is actually one of the old buildings from the 1930s forestry camp. Okay. So there's quite a lot there. Right. Well, that sounds fascinating. Well, um, can I be cheeky and ask if it's possible to come and poke my nose in some of these projects? If we get some money, and well, you do some work. <laughs> Absolutely. You're more than happy, yes. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you again, David, and hope to see you soon. Brilliant. Good to see you. Bye-bye.